Well, howdy everybody, this is John Michael Talbot. You know, the fire of lust is stirred up all around us in modern Western society. It's hard to get free. We're gonna be looking at how to do that. And there's a better way, a better truth, a better life in Christ. See you back here. All things are possible with God. Well, howdy everybody, this is John Michael Talbot. You know, it's hard to stay sexually pure in this society, isn't it? Think about it. Television, radio, movies, the internet, music, all the time we are being bombarded with a subliminal message about sexual morality that is not Christian sexual morality. And, it's so, so, and you are what you think. See, if you think it, you're going to do it. Garbage in, garbage out. Unless you are sitting there and you're watching something or hearing something or looking at something and you're going, I don't agree with this. You know, I, the shed blood of Jesus protects me from this. It is going to change you. And then pretty soon, we're going to want to try to figure out a way to rationalize that, justify that, argue that, and change what Jesus said to fit what we want, see? So let's take a look at some of this today <clears throat> because we have to be clear. We have to be clear in understanding good Christian sexual morality and fighting the fire of lust. Proverbs 6, 25, 27 through 29 says, "'Lust not in your heart after a woman's beauty, and in this case, he's speaking of adultery after somebody that's already married. Let her not captivate you with her glance. Can a man take fire to his bosom and his garments not be burned? Or can a man walk on live coals and his feet not be scorched? So with him who goes in to his neighbor's wife. Wow. You know, we, 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 are, we say we're a monotheistic uh, society, but we're really not. Most of us, and, and I understand that there are reasons for separations and divorces, and there are reasons for annulments. It can happen. But when that becomes the norm of a society, the society is, is doing something wrong. So we tend, maybe we're only married to one person at a time, but we're married to a lot of people in our lifetime. It's a revolving door, isn't it? So it's an interesting syndrome. Now, marriage is good. St. Paul says in 1 Corinthians 7, 8, and 9, he says it's better to marry than to be on fire. <laughs> and remember, as with the fire of the tongue, a little spark can set the forest ablaze. It can burn down your house. You know, you take this fire into your bosom, it's going to burn your clothes up. <laughs> And look at me with my beard. I got to watch out for extra stuff. <laughs> so, so marriage is good. God is not saying no sex. He's saying let's have our first relationship with Jesus as our lover. And if Jesus is first, then our other relationships can flow from that. Romans 1, 22, 24, and 27. Now, this one is rather controversial because we have the whole notion of gay marriage and all this that's circulating around our culture. Paul says, they claim to be wise, but they've turned into fools instead. God delivered them up in their lust to unclean practices. They engaged in mutual degradation of their bodies. Their women exchanged natural intercourse for unnatural. The men gave up natural intercourse with women and burned with lust. For one another. Whoa. Now, a lot of people have done a lot of things to try to make that not be against gay marriage. I understand the theological arguments, but I don't know, folks. Seems pretty clear to me.
seems pretty clear to me. We're going to talk about why later in the program. But the problem, see, is we have a sexually promiscuous mindset. Our nation has shifted from a Judeo-Christian moral base to a secular humanist moral base. And it's interesting, in the early church, the rise of Christianity by Rodney Stark brings this out. Early Christians, they said, no, women are not just sex objects. So they opposed prostitution. They opposed, uh, they really wanted men and women to be equal partners, two people entering into this relationship. And they also opposed, so they opposed prostitution. And when you had too many girl babies, you would sell your girl babies off into prostitution. And the early church said, no, nah, that's not a good thing. The early church also opposed abortion because when you had too many girl babies, you started aborting your fetuses. And it was a nasty business. So the church said, no, nah, not that. And the other thing that was common in Roman society, a good patrician, a good Roman leader, had a boy that he groomed. And part of that grooming was to have a sexual relationship with that boy. And the early church said, uh-uh, we're not going for that. So the early church opposed prostitution, abortion, and homosexual relationships, especially with young boys. And we were accused of crimes against humanity, and we were put to death for it for 200 years. For 200 years, the church suffered, but we grew at 40% a decade as people began to understand huh, that we were standing for something that was better, higher, more positive. So we see these patterns in Scripture. Now, the words for, for uh, lust, there's, there's three words that you're going to find in Scripture. The first is pornea, where we get pornography, and that means sexual lust. Another is thymus, or thumus, thumus, and it means lust. And the other is pathos, which means passion. So you'll find these words in Scripture. 1 John 2, 15 through 17 says, Do not love the world or the things of this world. Huh? So the normal things, in their case, it was the Roman world, the Greek world. In our case, it's uh, the, the secular humanist world. If anyone loves this world, the love of the Father is not in him. For all that is in the world, sensual lust, enticement of the eyes, pretentious of life, is not from the Father, but from the world. Yet the world is passing away. Whoever does the will of God remains forever. Wow. A lot of this has to do with how we think. Jesus says regarding, and, and Jesus takes us to a sexual morality that's higher than anything you're going to find out in our secular world. In Matthew 5, 25 through 30, in the, in the Sermon on the Mount, he says, You have heard that it was said, You shall not commit adultery. But I say to you, everyone who looks at a woman with lust, and the word there is thymos, has already committed adultery with her in his heart. Wow. So the core problem is not just action. It's not the law. You can't fix this with law. It's helpful. It points in the right direction. You got to get your mind right. It's kind of like cool hand Luke. <laughs> get your mind right, Luke. <laughs> you got rabbit in your blood. Well, sometimes we do too. See, in our mind, we're going and allowing ourselves to think these things. And Jesus says, that's where it starts. And wherever your treasure is, there will your heart be also. If you make sexual immorality something that is your treasure, it's in your mind. I guarantee you, your heart's going to follow, then your body is going to follow, and then you're going to act on it. And that ain't good. How do you fix it? He says, if your right eye causes you to sin, tear it out, throw it away. Well, you know, folks, let's be clear. <laughs> if you're having trouble listening to music, or watching the computer, or watching TV, turn it off. Turn it off. Fill your mind with positive things, and then you will begin to feel. In, you, instead of it being passions, pathos, 
negative passions, you will begin to be enthusiastic. You will, you will empower positive things with your emotions. You'll start, when you're so excited for God, you don't have any room to be excited for the world. You know, oil and water don't mix. You can't do two things at once. Fill your mind with God. Stir up your passions for God. And you're not going to have time to do this other stuff. Part of this is bringing the old self to the cross and letting the old person, the old thought patterns, the old feelings, the old actions, letting them die. Ephesians 4 says, you put all aside, you've laid aside your former way of life, the old self, which deteriorates through illusion, and here we got it, desire, desire, cravings. And don't be, don't, you know, the devil is a liar, John 8, 44. Lying speech is his, is his native tongue. He's a liar and he's the father of lies. He will come and try to get you to go along with this immoral thinking and acting. Don't buy it. For even Satan disguises himself as an angel of like, 2 Corinthians eleven fourteen. Make no mistake about this, St. Paul says to Ephesians. No fornicator, no unclean or lustful person, in effect an idolater, has any inheritance in the kingdom of Christ and of God. Let no one deceive you with worthless arguments. Strong language, isn't it? Strong language. So, let's get free of it. We're going to be coming back, looking at what the church says about this as a teaching, and how to get free of turning our negative passions around and being filled with positive passions, the fire of God. Oh, Jesus Christ, Son of God, have mercy on a sinful one, Lord Jesus Christ, Son of God, have mercy on me, a sinful one. Maker of the bread From the wheat of my life Savior of my soul Anointed Christ Forgiveness and love When I stumble and fall Compassion and mercy Have mercy, O oh God Well, howdy, everybody. We're talking about the fire of lust and how to overcome it with the fire of God. Now, the Catholic Church gives us some pretty good teachings on sexual ethics. They're time-tested, they're well thought out, and basically there are three things that the Catholic Church would say are necessary. And I think this teaching is really good, not only for Catholic Christians, but for all Christians. I think most people kind of agree with it. The first thing is in a relationship with somebody else, you gotta have mutual self giving, mutual self-emptying. Boy, that's a showstopper right there, isn't it? If you're going to be, if you're going to have a sexual relationship with somebody, it's got to be for them and not for you. It is mutually self-emptying, self-giving. And what we discover in the paradox of Jesus is that when you lose yourself for his sake, you find out who you really are. So when you give, 
even though you have no, there's, there's no intention, you're not doing this for the motivation of getting back. You don't give to get. That's not love. You give to give. But what happens is you get back more than you ever gave. The gospel principle is you get back 30, 60, and 100 fold. So mutual self-giving. How many of us really enter into sexual relationships with other people for their benefit? How about you guys? How do you feel about that? Men are, all, men are kind of basic, aren't we? So that's a showstopper. It has to be in the context of marriage, number two, because if you're going to be that self-disclosing, if you're going to be, if you're going to open your soul to somebody else, if you're going to be spiritually naked before somebody else, that takes trust. It takes a lot of trust. And the church would say, do that in the context of marriage, because you're, a, you're making a commitment. I'm going to be with you for life. I'm making a commitment. I can show you everything about myself, not just physically, spiritually, emotionally, intellectually. That takes trust. So in the context of marriage. And the third is Trinitarian. Marriage is also a sacrament, a, sacra a sacred mystery showing and effecting the union between Jesus and the church. So when two are mutually self-giving and totally give themselves to each other for the sake of the other, not for themselves, then at least a third life is created. That's Trinitarian, isn't it? So procreation is possible under normal circumstances doesn't mean that couples that can't have children aren't validly married. But it is extraordinary. It is not ordinary. Most people can. So I'm not going to go through the list, but come on, do a little mental, little inventory right there. What do those three things rule out? It rules out quite a bit. The stuff that's controversial. But in the Catholic teaching, it's not about what you can't do. It's about what you can do. See, we want to be positive, not negative. The fire of lust is a negative fire. The fire of God is a positive fire. So we want to be positive. Oh, I just, I just heard my iPad. Did you hear that? Yes, God is calling me. <laughs> That's what I tell people in my, in my uh, live ministry. So I'll tell that to myself right now and turn it off. OK, it's off. All right. So. Here's the other deal, though. You can't do this just out of law. You got to do it for the Spirit. The law is good. St. Paul tells us that the, that the law is a, is a tutor, a, a, a schoolmaster, see, to get us going in the right direction. So law is good if it's used rightly. But the law won't save us. We've got to have the inspiration in spirit. See, inspire in spirit. We've got to have the inspiration of the spirit to motivate us to do the right thing or doing the right thing when we want to do the wrong thing is miserable. I don't want you to be miserable. I want you to be blessed, macarious. I want you to be happy. So when we have the spirit, now we're being holy because that's, that's what we want to do. It's the fire that fires us to be on fire for God, to be holy, see, to be pure. We're just motivated. Now, a lot of people say, you know, I'm not religious, I'm spiritual. A lot of these big megachurch pastors, they actually kind of have made a whole teaching of that. Well, guess what? You need spirituality and religion. Religion without the spirit is dead. It just becomes the law. It's a good law, but we're using it wrongly. But you need the religion to put the inspirations of the spirit on the ground with feet. To incarnate the spirit, you need religion and spirit. So it's like two wings on, a, on the wings of the dove. Huh? One is religion, one is spirituality. So we need the law and we need spirit. Have you ever noticed that the flesh kind of tends to, I don't know about you guys, without the spirit, I want to do the right thing, but I don't. 
<laughs> Hello? Can anybody say chocolate? <laughs> yeah. So I want to do the I want to keep my calories down, but oh, just one more sweet. <laughs> so the flesh, the scriptures tell us, is actually at enmity with the spirit. So the flesh tends, so don't be surprised when your flesh wants to do the stuff you don't want to do. And the stuff you don't want to do, see, or the stuff you want to do, it won't do, and it keeps doing the stuff you don't want to do. St. Francis called his body brother ass like a donkey because he couldn't get it to stop going, you know, hee-haw, it, it just kept going, and it won't stop. And you can't get it to go where you want it to go. You need the power of the Spirit in your life. Jesus has got to be your lover. He's got to be your first spouse. And the power of the Spirit is Him within you as the bride of Christ. Now you want to be holy and pure. I just think this is all so cool. <laughs> I don't know about you guys. So we got to have the law helps us, teaching helps us, but we got to be inspired by the Spirit. Galatians 5, 16. You know, if you read chapter 5, there's a list of the works of the flesh. And in there you're going to find sexual immorality, the fire of lust. And then he says the fire, or excuse me, the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, mildness, generosity, here it comes, chastity, or self-control, and faith. Against such there is no law. And here's how to do it. Those who belong to Christ Jesus have crucified their flesh with its passions and desires. And since we live now by the Spirit, Let's follow the Spirit's lead. See, sometimes I want to do the right thing. I just can't do it. I want to stir up the Spirit. I just can't do it. You have to bring yourself to the cross, your thoughts, your, your body, your feelings, your words, your actions. You bring your whole self to Jesus and you let it die. And when the old self dies, now we can be born again. We can be resurrected. We can become a new creation in the resurrection of Jesus Christ. That's the key right there. Bring the old self to the cross and let it go. I want to end with two things. One is from St. Bonaventure. Speaking about the fire of lust, you can see, I can see no other explanation than, our, than that our love for God has turned to frost and ice within us. Most certainly, if we were burning with love, we would shed our worldly garments to follow the naked Christ. As wax melts before the fire, so vice perishes before love. When we are inflamed with the ardor of such celestial desire, the whole creation seems bitter and tiresome. Is that fire of God burning in you? I pray it is. That fire will melt away vice and sin, and you can fight the fire of lust with the fire of God, so that the fire of lust cannot jump that fire break and do more damage. Be on fire with your love for Jesus and fight the fire of lust. And you will win because all things are possible with God. I love you guys. I'll see you back here next time.
nothing trouble you And let nothing frighten you For everything passes But God will never change